talk about that probably shouldn't be applicable anymore based upon other changes to the spec. So yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of stuff. Yep. All right. All right. It's three after. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's see. Update team. All right. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm community time. Okay. Anything from the community if you want to bring up? Nada. Okay. SDK. Um, Scott or Clemens, I, I know we have a call scheduled for after this one, but is there anything you want to mention on this call? Or anybody else from the SDK work? Nope. All right. We made some progress on the uh, conformance invoker part of the test, but that's about it. Okay. Cool. If you guys have any questions about that, feel free to join the, the SDK call right after this one. Um, incubator status. Okay, we're still scheduled for September 17th. I have the proposal PowerPoint deck is still here. I have not uploaded it into the agenda yet. I was going to do that uh, later this week. Um, I believe we're technically ready to go. We do have three end users, but we can always use more. Um, the chart looks kind of small with just the three. So if you do have any you want to mention, please uh, let me know. Other than that, I do believe we are ready to go. So fingers crossed. I did create an outline doc for the two sessions at KubeCon North America. It's pretty much what we agreed to before. Um, so please feel free to look at that, edit it as you see fit in terms of adding topics. And of course, if you do want to talk to one particular section, uh, stick your name there. Um, don't hesitate putting your name next to something that already has someone else's name there. We can work out who's going to you know, how we're going to arm wrestle to figure out who's going to do it later. But just having a list of people to choose from would be nice. Um, so feel free to add your name to that as you start thinking about these things. We still have time to work that out. It's not till November. Um, I think that's it in terms of administrative, administrative stuff. Anything else before we start talking about PRs that you want to bring up? All right, cool. In that case, Clemens, which PR would you like to talk to? The one you just opened or the one that was there since Monday or Tuesday? So I would, so there's two um, that are related and I think the, after the discussion we had on the PR, um, I was convinced, um, which occasionally happens by Evan, that, um, <laughs> that we should pull this into, we should pull that entire concern into the JSON encoding and to make it not so, not as weird as it would be if we were introducing a um, extra attribute just for JSON. Um, I chose to ch change the attribute. So I would like to talk to 492. Okay, hold on a sec. Doo, 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 doo. So what I did here is I effectively removed data encoding completely, contrary to what we said uh, before. So I removed that entire concept. Okay. Um, I changed, so in mapping, so this is in the JSON format. What I've changed there is basically um, saying, um, if, if it's a string, um, then it must be, it must be called data. And then there's these extra rules for clean JSON mapping, which also apply to that field. For binary, um, if it's binary, then the, the the member name in the JSON object must be data underscore base64. So that's our that's the way how we distinguish between the two. If it's data, it's either uh, inline JSON or it's a string because those two cases are indistinguishable. Um, and if it's base64 encoded binary, then the name changes. The how I got there was that the comment that Evan made on the prior PR 491, he said, well, if you would do this for other text formats, where we have the same problem, then you would probably use an annotation in YAML and you would use an attribute in XML, which um, speaks to me. And uh, so I'm like, okay, I, I don't want to, I don't want to have something that is, if we make something that's specific for JSON, which in effect, in effect is, um, then it should be somewhat similar to the function of an attribute in XML, um, rather than having introducing a whole new attribute that is inside the, inside the, 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 the events that kind of sits in parallel, 
but describes data just in the JSON case. That, that seems a little strange to me. If it's, if it's not a general thing, but really only applies to JSON, the JSON encoding shouldn't be adding extra things in it. So that's the solution for this. If you scroll a little bit further down, um, that's how this would look then, basically. So yes, like that. So instead of data, if it's basic before encoded, it's simply called data underscore basic before. Um, and um, by implication can be either the one, one or the other. And then in our main spec, that entire concept just goes away. So data content encoding is gone and uh, the, the related comments as well. So it really becomes a, it purely becomes something that is inside of the JSON um, uh, event format and there, um, it's a, it's a, if you will, a flag kind of thing on the the data field by by naming the data field accordingly if it's basic before if it contains basic before data. So, question: um, If if I get uh, a, a, a JSON cloud event, how do I know which of the two to look in, uh, the data oh. or the data basic before? Uh, they're, they're they're mutually exclusive. Sorry. They are mutually exclusive. Well, you can only have one of them. Okay. Yes. And, but sorry, I, I think the question still stands. How should I know which one I should expect to be there? Is there a mapping from a uh, content type or something like that? Or? Um, if you, well, if you get a data underscore basic before, that implies that you, that you have your data is binary and that it's basic before encoding. And then you have to, yeah, I mean, you still have to, you still have to reconcile that with whatever the, the, the content type is, right? So if the, your content type is um, uh, text slash XML, uh, semicolon, char set, epsidate, then you have to go, go and take that base 64, turn it into a binary, run it through the epsidate decoder, and then decode the XML. Anybody else have a question or comment? So, so I, I'm generally favorable on this one. Um, in the specific case of JSON, which is where we live all the time, um, it's better if you don't have fields whose type can sort of randomly vary. So this would probably facilitate the task of mapping this into POJOs or, or other equivalents. So sounds good. So I, I have a question if no one else can raise their hand. Um, I think you may need to add a little bit of text in here to make it more explicitly clear that you can't have both data and data underscore base 64. Um, Cause I don't think it says it yet. Um, and someone may put both in there, but I wanna make it clear that having both in there is an invalid cloud event. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah, uh, but, but the other thing is that- Yes. But the, my, my bigger concern, cause that's just a wording change. Is that my bigger concern is I guess it's related to what Tim was saying is, since obviously I, I haven't looked at this till just now and I obviously even haven't even coded it up. From a coding perspective, I, I am actually concerned about the exact opposite of what Tim said. I, I wonder whether it's actually harder for people to not know where to look, especially if you're writing a generic cloud event processor. Um, Cause now you have to look for both and I understand some of the concerns of having a, a sort of a modifying property that rides alongside things, but I don't think that's that weird of a thing because you kind of have that already with things like HTTP headers, like, you know, your, your content type tells you how to interpret, you know, the HTTP body, right? And that can vary based upon on, on, on the value. We don't have two different types of HTTP bodies, one for binary, one for readable text, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? So I get, I'm a little nervous about that. I don't think it's necessarily a showstopper, but it, I have to admit it does make me a little nervous to have a, a, a changing attribute name based upon its type. So the, um, the, the well, the alternative to this is, set, is 491. Right. Which is um, uh, the rename we talked about. And that is um, basically renaming the data content encoding into data encoding simplifying that so that's that change right um and that basically removes all the references to the prior to um, i i cleaned it up even more than we discussed 
where um, I removed all the references uh, that confused people to um, the content. Um, uh, what was that called? Content, not, con not content, content transfer encoding um, of SMTP, which I was referencing because of Base64. Um, and there was like content encoding and transfer encoding. People had all kinds of ideas. So I had, I, I basically removed all that and just, just point to uh, the basic before uh, encoding standalone RFC. Um, and then, um, and then basically clarify that in the um, reference that in the, um, in the JSON spec. So this is, effect, this is where, this is the, 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 what we have right now in the spec, but uh, you know, make it a little bit more tight and related only to the data field without people getting, can, without there being a chance of people getting confused about the, the content, um, uh, the various transport fields. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to <clears throat> ask some folks who have actually implemented this stuff, and I guess in particular the SDK guys, what's your thoughts on, on the two PRs? Don't make me name names, because I will. <laughs> okay, Scott, I'm gonna pick on you first. Yeah, I, I already have to do kind of a funny dance to understand if the data payload is either the encoded version or the uncoded version. So having two different places that the, the base 64 encoded data is supposed to live actually makes it a little easier for me to implement this. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. What, one, qu one question I do have though is, the SDK will probably help you decode the data into the, the binary version of whatever it is. And I, I find it useful to cache that. And so I've been sticking it back in the data and I have a flag internally in the, um, the in-memory object that says this currently is in the state of in either encoded or decoded. And then if, it, if that event goes back out, the uh, codecs know that it should turn it back into base 64, not based on content encoding type and the internal state that doesn't get sent. So is there a similar mechanism in this? Uh, how, how would I, if I have both data and in uh, base 64 data, which one do I know to send? If you have, well, you, you need to know whether your data is binary. I think that's that's the, that's the decision. The encoding, the encoding is what you do when you flush it out to the wire. Well, Scott, let me ask you a question about that. Do you plan on exposing two different attributes to the user of the SDK or just one? I have to read this a little more carefully, but I, I've been exposing helper methods that uh, the user gets to ask, uh, please give me the either the raw version or a, a version that's been perhaps uh, unmarshaled into some other structure. So Clemens, what, what, what's your thought on this? How, how would you expose this as an SDK user? Oh, would you... so in, in, the SDK, in the SDK, I would make the difference between the two go away. This is just a wire, this is just a wire thing. So if data, data underscore base 64 shows up, um, I uh, decode, I basically decode this and stuff that into a byte array and the byte array becomes the type of, of the data property. And then if um, the, um, if data shows up, then it becomes um, an object graph. Right. In the simplest case, it's a string, and then otherwise, if it uh, contains JSON data, it's a JSON graph. So it's it's if it's either it's a J, it's a set of JSON objects, or complex or not, um, or it's a binary it's binary data. But you can tell effectively by saying you know data is and do type inference, etc. So that makes it easy. So yeah, I want to make sure I understand the the flip side. So the user has a cloud event object that they're stuffing bits of metadata into and, and they stick something inside of data, you would dynamically check to see whether that data object has binary stuff in it or just straight text and make the decision as to whether you use data versus data underscore base 64 based upon that? If you give, if you give me a byte, if you set a byte array on data, 
I will and you render as JSON. I will stuck. I will stick that in base data underscore basic four and make it basic four. If I render, if I render it as JSON, you so if me. you so you set you 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 walk up to you walk up to the cloud event object, you go to the data property and you assign a byte array to it. Oh, right. Then under the covers, as that gets flushed out to the wire, that data gets basic before encoded and gets put into the data underscore basic before field. If I read that back in that event, I read that through the JSON encoder, the JSON encoder, the JSON encoder goes and takes a look at the doc at the document. We'll say data underscore basic before will run the basic before decoder over it, gets a byte array, and that's the byte array that I assign back to the data property. That's, that's all I do. Like that that detail difference, nobody sees that detail difference. Like if they go if you go into the into the I have this raw collection inside of the the the, the data cloud event object that is all the attributes in, in effectively in the raw, that raw thing will be uh, a, a a data a, thing, a property called data that contains the actual data, the deserialized data set. So that assumes then that your data attribute is somewhat dynamic because you can handle any different type. And what if I give you a string that has characters in it that aren't valid JSON? Would you then automatically convert it to base sixty four as well? If you give me data and the string. Um, I would, I would, well, I would first uh, follow, I would follow the, the JSON escaping rules for that string. Okay. Right. So, I mean, yeah. the JSON encoder does that for me. You can go in and put whatever, whatever you want in it. And then there's rules that JSON encoder, that JSON will do to make sure that you can represent your string. That's true. Okay. I forgot about that. Okay. Never mind. So, so it's really just, this is literally just the flag on data for transport purposes that says, um, that basically indicates that the content of this is basic for. Right. And we're deleting the, the, um, the envelope flag for base 64 encoded, right? Correct. That's the, so that's the, that's the, um, that is this chain. Effectively that envelope flag, the prior, the prior PR uh, 491, is um, where I ch where I tamed down effectively that envelope uh, flag to you know allow to make sure that it refers to data only, and people don't get confused. And this step here is effectively doing away with that altogether and just making a an indicator, if you will, as a suffix on the on the member name in JSON, and and making that effectively JSON only concern, right? Because and this this is what, and and if you can you go into four ninety one into um, the uh, the the comments oh the comments yes um, so you want Evans right yeah exactly Evan so Evan says right rightly says if if for hypothetical XML encoding in data for data if he would probably then use encoding base sixty four and there are actually in XML um, as Tim will tell you, 400 ways to declare that the data inside of there is four, basic before. Um, and uh, so that's, that seems to be the, this, this strikes me as the right way to do this for XML. And then um, uh, YAM, YAML also has a way to, to go and declare this as an annotation. So it seems like if it's not a problem for those two text formats, then we should also solve that problem just as, as much locally for, for Jason. So that was my head opener. You see, what's interesting is when I was talking to Evan about this yesterday, my assumption was that if we ever did come up with an XML or YAML encoding, that we would say that the data content encoding flag would appear as a property or as, a, as an attribute here in, in XML or then you encode data this way in YAML. We wouldn't necessarily have to force a, another top level property. Yeah, and that's and that's why that's why the top load property is is gone. But I need to go and put it somewhere. Yeah, it's just interesting because with with your new with your latest proposal, what you're basically doing is making it a transport specific concern. And yes, the the, the nice thing about defining it in our spec was that you at least have consistency at an abstract level. 
it just may appear differently at, at the serialization level. And we're saying, nope, we're not even going to define it at the abstract level. It's completely a serialization problem. I was, I was going down that path, um, commenting on, on, um, on um, Evan's uh, concern. And then, and, and one, of the, one of the arguments is obviously that um, there was a time where it, when everybody thought that XML would be the last text-based format that anybody would ever use. Um, and then everything became XML and run by XML rules. And now everybody seems to be a big fan of JSON and you know, there will be the next thing. Um, so you know, having something that is um, you know, more abstract and then helps with the basic before case in general might be useful. Um, but first, I don't see that coming um, really yet. Um, and uh, second, um, this is not so bad. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I was, yeah, I convinced myself that the abstraction is not necessary. Okay. So let me ask this. I know, Clement, since you bothered putting together the second PR that has the data base 64 attribute, that you obviously prefer that one. Scott, I'm assuming your LGTM in the comments or in the, in the chat implies you prefer the second one. Uh, anybody else on the call want to speak in favor of the original PR, the one that just did the name change for the most part? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Does that imply that everybody on the call would prefer the second PR? Okay. I believe since that PR was just open today, it'd be unfair for us to actually approve it today. Um, However, uh, last chance, is there anybody, I, I still think you may need a little bit smarter text that says you can't have both in there, but I think that's a minor typographical thing. Are there other things relative to this PR that people would like to discuss or is everybody pretty much, yeah, this is the way to go? Isn't there something related to um, data ref, like the, uh, the, the rain check data? Is that, did that go in or is that still pending? Rain check, you mean the, the, the deferred retrieval stuff? Yeah. I don't think that's an extension. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, I think we made an extension. Let's just double check. So what but if we made base64 encoded JSON an extension? Data ref. Oh, there it is. Do I? I can't say. So I'm sorry, say it again, Scott. You're proposing possibly what? I, I'm, I'm proposing uh, make make uh, base 64, database 64 uh, the same pattern as this uh, data ref extension for JSON. Well, then you're, ripping, then you're ripping a lot of things apart because we have the data content type, which describes data. And now you're saying, well, binary data goes into an extension. So then the question is, what does data content type not refer to? Like, I don't think that works. Well, I think data content type goes away. Yeah, but then you still can't describe if you have a string what that string is. You can't signal sorry, that. Sorry. Not, not data content type. I meant the data content encoding. I, I guess I'm confused, Scott, as to why we would make this an extension when sending binary data seems like a fairly core use case. Yeah, I think so. That's the part that I, I'm trying to wrap my head around. Scott, why do you think it would be an extension or better off as, as an extension? Because they look like the same thing to me or at least the same technique. I think I may need you to elaborate. I'm not sure no, I data, see how. Data, data ref is a reference to something that's outside of the outflow. That is, that is very different from, you know, a, a, a data, this is still the data field. The, unders, the, the underscore base 64 is effectively just an attribute on the data field that says 
inside this data field is base64. It's not a, it's it looks like a different field, but but conceptually it's the same thing as having an attribute on on um, an XML element. So do any of the other serializations need to be changed at all to support binary? No, because they all know they all know binary. So JSON is the only JSON is the even though it's popular, it's the weakest possible serialization format that anybody can imagine. So it doesn't it doesn't do binary. It also doesn't do dates. Interesting. Okay. That that's why it's popular. <laughs> yes, because it gives people work. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm bummed. Okay. Um, for for what it's worth, it's if we remove this ability for binary mode to send a base sixty four encoded binary data, then it removes a lot of testing that I have to do out of the SDK. So that's nice. If cutting features always removes testing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing is uh, close Clement's first PR, consider a second PR, and have to wait till next week to formally approve that or vote on it. Is that what I'm hearing from the group? I'm already on the way to, to close the PR. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, am I correct in that it does it close or what, what can we do with these guys? Do you remember Clemens? Or actually, I guess not not the tricky one. But I guess these two. These two go away completely yes. if we adopt number two. Right. right? Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, in that case, I, I need to ask: Are there any other topics related to Clemens PRs that we want to people want to bring up? Okay. In that case, let's talk about Evan's PR clarifications. Um, I don't know where we left off on this one. Okay, he has some link errors. However, Cle uh, Clemens, I thought you took an action item to mention that this one would be impacted by Tim's PR that we uh, adopted last week. Well, we had this we had this uh, uh, whole discussion around the data content type stuff. That all of that is no longer. Uh, hang on, this is the data content encoding. Okay. That's wrong. Yeah. So this stuff. Yeah. So okay. Uh, there's a lot of changes that need to go here if we adopt number two. That that is being uh, affected, and then there were. Um, and then there was. Some, I think some stuff with the um, character encoding stuff. Yeah, I think he did some this stuff right here. Yeah, because Tim clarified the non principle of what principle is, and I think this also um, is in conflict. Okay. So, well, I wonder, other, so I wonder what, what, and how much of this change. Let me scroll down once more. Yeah, it's not clear that we need. I think. I think. My guess is that we meanwhile address most of the things that are in this PR. Okay, uh, I don't think it's necessarily useful for us to walk through it right here. Uh, could you comment on this? I'll, I'll talk to Evans after this call, saying we're, it looks like we're headed towards your your second PR today, so that's going to impact yeah. obviously the data content encoding. But can you make a comment on why this section might need to change? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I think this actually still applies. And updates per comments number two. Okay. Cool. Anything sorry. else? I, I, sorry about that. I, I, oh. um, Not a problem. Okay. So I know you're busy. That's fine. Thank you. Um, now, Christoph, yours, I, I apologize, I only briefly skimmed it since it was so new, but it seemed like yours was more syntactical fixes. Is that true? Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. So we still have, we removed map from our type system and we still have it in all the event formats. So I removed that. 
And we added the added the URI. So I also added this to all formats. And then I did one more thing um, in the spec in that I inserted another header that's called type system. We had this before, we removed it, but all the event formats um, basically say, please refer to our type system. And for example, the JSON one even links back so that link is a relative link, so it doesn't really work anymore. So I think it, it makes sense to have a header there. Or well, that's okay. just a minor thing, I can also remove it. Then I would yeah. fix the link in the JSON uh, format. Yep, that's it. Okay. Um, this, like, since this is strictly syntactical, does anybody have any concern? Actually, my, my only concern is, I wonder if that should be three instead of four. Um, but it's a minor thing. Yeah, the, I wasn't sure about this either, but we have like the protocol and stuff. So I thought, but I can also make it free. Yeah, just because it's, 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 it's under this one, right? So that's why I was thinking it should be three. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. okay. But um, did you say that the relative hrefs in the other specs are broken and the link checker did not catch that? Well, I think the link still works. It just doesn't point you, it just points you at the document itself at the top of it and not into a sub part of it. Ah, got it. Okay. So, so I, don't, you... I don't know if the link checker does catch that. Okay. Do you want to, <clears throat> do you want to update those links so that they actually point to this section instead? They do now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I edited it with the same title. Oh, got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. In that case, um, any objections then to, a, to making this three and then adopting the PR? seems strictly editorial. Okay, cool. So, whoops, wrong one. Okay, cool. Um, this one's just never gonna go away. <laughs> Hold on a sec. I think this one needs to be updated based upon all the stuff we talked about today relative to Clemens PR, but let me just double check. Yeah, he needs to do some updates, so we can't even, we can't do it. Okay, so let's, let's skip that one. All right, so let's talk about timelines. My hope is, or this was my hope that we resolved PRs today. Obviously, we're not there yet. <clears throat> um, so this may be pushed out by a week, but I was wondering if maybe on next week, we could approve, uh, let's say we approve Clemens PR and maybe Evan's PR about the uh, tricky use cases stuff and this clarification in the binary, which I don't really think changes anything normatively. If we can get all those PRs in there, say by like Monday or so, so people have a chance to review it, what do people think about voting on next week's call to approve that as 0 0.9, which is technically release candidate one for version 1.0? And then give us um, two weeks to resolve any outstanding issues that people find as they review the docs, start a vote on September 19th, uh, do an offline vote since it's obviously a very big decision, close it on September 26th, and call it done. And then we can make an announcement on KubeCon. That obviously gives us all of October if for some reason we can't meet these, these deadlines to, to push it out, but I start off being aggressive. What do people think? Let's do it. Any other comments? I have okay. a super minor comment. We wanted yeah. to call it, uh, let me check on the roadmap, 1.0 minus RC and not 0 0.9. Otherwise, I fully support this. Zero. Yeah, 0 0.9 is very, very weird because we're jumping from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. 0 0.4, 0 0.9, 1. It's, I'm very much in favor of 1.0-RC1. There you go. Okay. That's a minor change to me. Any other comments? This is too easy. Okay, cool. Um, in that case, looking at other issues, uh, Clem, uh, Christoph, I think you said this one obviously would go away if um, 
if we approve Clemens PR number two, right? Yep. Okay. Um, webhook, I think Clemens, you and I still need to talk about that. I don't think that changes our core spec, so we don't need to worry too much. And the SDK, um, that's going to be talked about in the SDK call. I think, let me just double check here. <clears throat> in terms of issues for version one, um, Clemens, your PR addresses this one completely, right? I, I guess we already talked about that, never mind. I'm going to assume it's true. So we, I think your PR addresses all three of these. Um, yes. That one, that one. Okay, this is the big one then. Okay, so a long time ago, Thomas from Google asked basically, you know, what is, what's the criteria for going 1.0? And as of right now, uh, this list may be old, but I believe we have at least these implementations out there. And I think actually the list has grown now. If you look at the the incubator proposal for our for our work, um, I actually list quite a few more things in there. So this list is actually quite short in comparison. So for example, I know uh, Red has some, has some products, Oracle has one. I think there's a couple of others out there. Um, so my question for the group is, does the current implementation of the spec satisfy people's conceptual definition of exit criteria, or do we need to add things to the list? Should I assume silence means people are okay with? Is there, is there the possibility of a way of demonstrating interoperability or something like that? I mean, the fact that all these implementations exist is, is a fine thing, but do they actually talk to each other? We do have demos that we've done in the past. I'm not, and to be honest, I'm not 100% sure how much they show interoperability because it does show everybody can receive cloud events and process them correctly. Um, do you have some sort of demo in mind, Tim? Because we could look to put together that there's something for KubeCon, granted it's Short timeline, but we could try. I could probably volunteer to serve as a large scale source of cloud events in the not too distant future. That's a tease right there that I like. <laughs> um, go ahead, someone's going to say something? Uh, no, that's great. That, that's great. That makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but it would really be 1.0 only, right? I mean, so I'm not sh a lot of these other things are not 1.0, so I worry a little. Yeah, I would assume if There's, people, go, go ahead, comments. Yeah, so on, on our side, we've been, um, we're effectively waiting for 1.0 to lock so that we can go ahead and start updating our stuff. Um, so, so from the product side, um, there, will be, there will be action this year, but I, I don't think we'll rush it because now we're getting serious about the implementation stuff and that's part of it. So, so Tim, when you say that you'll be able to generate cloud events, is there a particular uh, product you have in mind that's going to be generating the cloud events? So we know what type of events are being sent? Uh, let's just leave it at, uh, we, I think we would probably be in a position to generate large numbers in a way that would be easy to flow, flow to you know, any destination that wanted to look at them. Yeah, the reason I'm asking for a little more specifics, if you can't, that's fine. The reason I was asking though was because if we did want to put together some sort of demo, we'd have to know, you know, the shape of the events coming in so people can know what to do with them as opposed to just, yes, I got it. I can parse it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. If you can't say anything, that's fine. Well, I mean, uh, we, we are, so yes. I mean, go look at the things that flow through event bridge, which is a, is a product. So uh, in, an existing product. So the assumption is that um, assuming, you know, assuming cloud events stabilizes and assuming this is not a promise. Okay. I'm not making a promise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and assuming things go the way I'd like, uh, we would probably be able to provide all of those of which there are, you know, millions per second um, in, in cloud events format. Okay. And there's a couple of hundred different, you know, d uh, payloads. Okay. So, I feel like there's two questions lingering still. One is, do we need more to, to meet exit criteria status? And two, do people want to look at a possibly new demo for KubeCon?
I think more valuable than a, a demo for KubeCon would be uh, more work on the conformance test framework. Yeah, I actually agree with that. Okay. And how can we move that along? I know Scott, you mentioned someone at Google possibly helping you, but what other things are you thinking of in terms of asking for help? I mean, if, if people have more experience in writing conformance test frameworks than I do, uh, please come help me because I'm making choices that you may or may not agree with. <laughs> so I need help. Okay. So obviously if you're interested in that, please join the SDK call right after this one. So let, let, let's go back around to the first question I asked. Exit criteria. Do people think we need to add more beyond the current set of implementations that we know about? And possibly the conformance test suite that Scott's mentioning. I'm going to assume silence means people are, are okay with current state of things, in which case I'm tempted to close this issue. Does anybody disagree? Okay, let me ask it more formally. Is there any objection then to closing this issue with the assumption that our current state of implementations and testing and stuff is sufficient for exit criteria? All right. I don't hear any objection. I'm going to do it. It's not on here. Okay, I'll fix it. Uh, Thomas's issue. Approved to close. Okay. In that case, are there any other topics people would like to bring up? Otherwise, we have Should a plan. Should we define a process for one dot one, or what happens if we discover an issue with? 1.0 after it's officially launched? We can start that discussion, sure. Let me just do one quick thing though. Ginger, are you there? Ginger? What about Klaus? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Javier? Yes. Okay. And John M, is that the same John Mitchell? Okay, Ginger, are you there yet? Yeah, okay. I was, this was John, yeah. I, I okay, was able to log in. Oh, that's what I thought, okay, cool. All right, so Ginger, if you come back, just ping me through. I'm through, here, uh, I'm sorry. Right, there you are, okay. I figured that actually, that came right when you asked me. <laughs> yep. oh, okay, not a problem. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the other issue that was just brought up, how to handle changes going forward. Uh, can I make a remark or two on that? Um, yeah, please. I, I, I've, we've discovered that once you actually start shipping um, these things at scale, the inertia that develops, the inertia develops, huge inertia develops almost instantly. Yeah. And aside from adding fields, new fields, it is insanely difficult, verging on impossible to change anything. <laughs> so, so um, it, you know, please do not, uh, uh, you know, relax our vigilance in the hopes that, oh, if there's something wrong, we can fix it in 1.1, because the chances are substantial that we can't. I agree. That's why, yeah, and I, that's why I think the, the two or three week review period that we're going to have here is critical. Yes. But I believe the overall question is still a good one. Uh, and, I, and honestly, from my perspective, I, I, I don't think we can necessarily lock down too many things until we actually start seeing issues. Um, because if all the issues are you know, syntactical in nature, obviously we can do those as long as they don't change anything normatively. If someone was to find something significant enough that we thought we can't change this without breaking backwards compatibility, then we're just gonna need to decide, okay, do we ignore the issue or do we go over version two? And I don't think we can make that decision until we see how big of an issue it really is. So my, I'm inclined to say, well, we can't answer too much until we get there, until we see the issue itself. I'd like to you know, there, there's, never been a, there's never been a JSON version two, and there is a XML version 1.1, which is universally ignored. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So what do other people think? Is there some sort of formal process or something we need to define now? I mean, we already agreed that we're doing SEMVR, so that kind of limits our process a little to some extent. So 
So Vlad, that was you that asked the question, right? Yep, that was me. Yeah, is there something, was there something specific you were hoping to, to define? Nope, just wanted to start a discussion around it, basically, to make sure that we know what we're getting into uh, after we release 1.0. Yeah. And it sounds good to me, like we get a version out and we're going to actually get some usage and we're going to see what this develops into. Yep. But I don't know, the only other comment I can make is do we want a longer, I don't know, preview period where this is added as supported by multiple tools and then we see is there any point in that i don't really see it so i don't know that's why i want to start the issue to see if other people think this needs to be discussed now or not sorry i was on mute i was assuming that on september 19th we would vote to start the vote and if people have concerns large or small about starting the vote because the spec isn't ready, I expect them to raise those by then. And, that, and like I said, we still have a whole month before KubeCon to, to work through any of those issues, but it, this becomes a, 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 a very important step for the working for the entire working group, right? Now's the time to look at the spec with a fine tooth comb. Because as Tim said, making changes later is gonna be darn near impossible. So it's on everybody to do a good thorough review. Okay. In that case, we can end a little early. Um, unless there's other, is there any other topic people want to bring up? Okay. In that case, I think we're done. Um, oh, I, I did want to mention one thing. I, I, um, uh, Chris Anacek pinged me uh, earlier in the week asking about our version 1.0 status. Um, basically hinting that uh, they would love to make some PR noise around this in the not too distant future. So there, there are obviously are people within at least the CNCF, aside from our little group here, that are very anxious for this thing to go forward. So I thought that was a, a very nice little sign that, that it's not just us on this call that are interested. There are other people who definitely want to see this thing move forward. So I just thought I'd mention that. And the CNCF is all eager to make noise around this, which is great. All right, in that case, unless anybody has anything else, I believe we're done and we'll resume the call again in about 10 minutes for the SDK call. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, bye guys.